Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me again and welcome to any new viewers. This is To The Point English with Ben and I'm Ben. And as you can see, back by popular demand, I have Craig with me again, the uh, famous Craig, uh, because we're going to be practicing uh, another speaking paper, this time of the C2 proficiency exam. And of course, Craig, for those of you who watched my last video on the C1 advanced speaking paper, uh, you'll all know Craig, and you'll know that he's a former Cambridge examiner with 24 years experience. Um, but he's much more than that, of course. Um, Craig, first of all, welcome. Thank you very much, Ben. It's nice to be back. Thanks for asking me back. And I'm really pleased that that first C1 video helped some people. And hopefully this one will do the same for C2 candidates. I'm sure it will. Yeah, as I said, back by popular demand, because a few people... Um, in the comments to that C1 video asked about the C2 proficiency. They were very, they, they found the C1 very useful, but they, they wanted a C2 proficiency example too. So that's, that's what we're going to do today. So again, I'm a little nervous, even because, you know, we're going up at a level now. Um, I'll see if I can cope. Again, Craig is going to act as the interlocutor, the examiner. Um, but at some moments, he's also going to play the role of my partner, uh, so again, I'm I'm asking a lot of Craig, but he's very professional, as you know. I'm sure he'll cope. Um, but before we get started, Craig, for for those few people who didn't see the first video, um, could you just introduce yourself? Apart from being a, a former Cambridge examiner, you're much more than that, as I said. Well, yes. If you haven't seen me before, uh, my name's Craig. As Ben said, I'm originally from the UK, from London, but now. As Ben does, I live in, in Spain, in Valencia, and I teach English. I teach English online. I have been in the past a Cambridge examiner for about 25 years, but now I teach English mainly conversation classes online, and um, we also have a podcast. If you like listening to podcasts, go to englishpodcast.com and you'll be able to hear our weekly show to help you improve your English even further. I highly recommend that podcast, as I have done in previous videos. Um, but also you have these these masterclasses, don't you, Craig, at en englishmasterclass.net. So could you tell us a bit more about those? Yes, basically I prepare students for the Cambridge B2 first exam mm -hmm. over there on englishmasterclass.net. And that's also the website you want to go to if you have a need to improve your fluency if you want to work on English conversation, maybe if you want to improve your confidence a little bit and become a, a more confident speaker, then I'm running these courses during the week and on Sunday. I'm working Sunday afternoons too. Wow. So if that interests you, go over and uh, have a look for more information, join the email list, and I'll send you some details about the courses. Yep, fantastic. As as always, of course, these links will be in the description to this video. So. I highly recommend you check that out. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions for Craig, I'm sure um, he'll be happy to answer them. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so we're going to basically do the same as we did for the C1 Advanced, but for the C2 Proficiency, because uh, the B2 First exam and the C1 Advanced speaking papers um, are very similar in many ways, but the C2 Proficiency is quite different. Um, as you're going to see. So for those of you who have maybe taken this B2 first or C1 advanced, then you're considering the C2 proficiency. It's very important that you understand the differences. Um, there are some differences in the task, some practical differences, but also, of course, this is a higher level. So people often ask me, and maybe Craig, you can uh, help with this. You know, What is the difference between C1 advanced and C2 proficiency? Of course, it, it, the easy answer, the easy answer, the simple answer is that it's a higher level. But what does that mean? For me, it, it, of course, your pronunciation should be should be clear, and uh, your intonation should be correct. Uh, you should be, speak more fluently. Uh, your grammar should be accurate or, or more accurate. Um, but for me, the biggest difference is the vocabulary. I think you're expected at C two level to be precise and not not just use more or less a good enough word you're kind of expected to use the best word like collocations or fixed expressions or even idiomatic expressions would you agree with that craig or? I, I do i do agree with that it's obviously important to have a wide vocabulary but also 
feel and appear to be and to be very comfortable mm -hmm. with um, speaking English and interacting in English. And um, one thing, when I was thinking about doing this with, with Ben, I was thinking, well, what is the difference between C1 and C2? And when I used to teach in a language school in the British Council for many years, I noticed that even though students came in at a lower level, say uh, B1 or A2, and gradually over years and years and years of studying at the academy, managed to get to C2, they still didn't have a natural ability to use the vocabulary that Ben mentioned and to use, have the flexibility in the language and feel comfortable enough to be able to communicate and, and pass the C2. And I think in in many cases, but not all, those students that did have success had spent some time abroad in an English-speaking country mm -hmm. because living and working abroad does give you that knowledge that you can't necessarily get studying for four hours a week in a classroom from course books. Do you agree with that? I do, yes. I do agree, but I still think you can i think the big difference is that you can't learn or you can't reach a c2 level of english in a couple of years just by studying yeah in a more academic way i think you usually a c2 level student has been immersing themselves in english for for years you know they yeah. usually read in english regularly you know before they decide to take the exam which, which um, you can do, which you can do in your exactly. country. You don't need to do that in an English speaking country, but as, as but immerse yourself is the right phrase. You need to be listening to a lot of native speakers. You need to be reading a lot. You need to be immersing yourself for a long time in English to get, to get this C2 level. Yeah, exactly. Because that's why I mentioned vocabulary because you can study all of the grammar or most of the grammar in a few months, right? It's, it's, there's a lot of grammar, but it it's not it, it is doable. It's possible to to um, study it all in a few months. You can't learn all the vocabulary, uh, so it's something you just have to be yeah doing for for years for for you know surrounding yourself with English, immersing yourself in in English for a long time. Um, having said that, preparing for and passing a Cambridge English exam is a lot to do with preparation, you know, understanding the format, understanding what's expected of you. And that's why I offer my preparation, on online preparation courses, which uh, really focus on the strategy and approach. But yeah, I completely agree, agree with what Craig was saying there. It's, um, it, it's, it's a more natural uh, and feeling comfortable with the language. It's, it's, um, it's a big part of it. So so we'll see. One thing I, I did mention the pronunciation before, and I don't think we spoke about this in the last video. Um, accent and pronunciation are two different things. Sometimes they overlap, or maybe we did mention this in the last video, but it's very important. Whatever accent you have, if you have an Italian accent, a French accent, a Chinese accent, a Portuguese accent, uh, it's fine. All accents are equally accepted. It, you will not be penalized for having an accent. It's only a problem if you're if it's a pro pronunciation issue, so individual sounds and intonation. Um, so of course, I'm a native English speaker. I don't think I'll have a problem with that. I may have pro a problem with other issues, but um, but yeah, I I, th I know that a lot of people really worry about their accent. Uh, there are three parts to the proficiency speaking paper, the C2 proficiency. Um, there's the interview part one, the collaborative part, collaborative task, which is part two. And then part three consists of two tasks, basically. You have the long term and the discussion. That's all contained in part three. So, yes, we're, we're going to take it part by part. So we'll give feedback after each part. Um, part one is basically the same as C1. The only the big difference is that you, for the C2 proficiency candidates, you will know what the first two questions will be. They will be... Uh, where are you from and are you working or studying at the moment? So that kind of gives you an advantage. You can prepare, you can, but what you must be careful of is not sounding prepared or rehearsed. You want to sound natural and kind of spontaneous, but because most people are nervous in exams, I do recommend you have an idea of what you're going to say for those first questions. Maybe not 
don't learn it by heart, but just have an idea of some of the vocabulary you can use and what you're going to say. Any last tips for, for this part, part one, Craig? Or? Um, no, just just be natural. Uh, we mm-hmm. mentioned body language at the end of mm. um, the last video, and I think it's important to make eye contact, be expressive, be open, and try and enjoy it. Try and warm up, get into the interview, and um, do the best you can. Let, mm-hmm. let them hear your English. Go for it. Yeah, I think that's a good attitude. It's it's an opportunity. You, it's your opportunity to demonstrate your level. So, yeah, take advantage of this opportunity. Don't feel... I mean, you are being judged, you are being evaluated, but try and see it another way. You are, you know, but you're being given a stage to perform on, so make sure you let them know how good your English really is. Exactly, exactly. Just grab the ball by the horns and, and go for it, all positive. <laughs> Having said that, now I'm I'm getting nervous because it's my turn. And, um, we're and get good, started. so you should be. You should be nervous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But if I, uh, if somebody said that in the comments of the last video, if, if Ben's nervous, imagine how we feel. <laughs> and it's true. It's true. But in your exam, there will only be two people evaluating you. I have potentially thousands of people will be watching this, but uh, yeah. I'm a native English speaker and it's my, my job. I've prepared many people, thousands of people for this, this exam. So let's see, let's see how it goes. So let's see. Yeah. Mr. Interlocutor, when you're ready. Okay, good morning. My name's Craig, and this is my colleague, Susan. And your names are? I'm Ben. Thank you. Well, first of all, we'd like to know something about you. So, Ben, where are you from? Well, I was born in England, in in London, on the outskirts of London, in a, in a very nondescript neighbourhood. Uh, but when I was young, I moved with my family to a picturesque little village um, in Cambridgeshire. And now I live in a very bucolic area of Spain in Asturias. Thank you. And are you working or studying at the moment, Ben? I'm working. I'm a I'm an English teacher. Um, I've been teaching English for over 20 years now. And uh, yes, just as well, because I, I hate studying. I'm, I'm a terrible student. So I, I'm, I prefer working than studying, definitely. What kind of work would you like to do in the future? Uh, I think... I'd be happy to to continue teaching. I'm, I'm very happy with my current situation. Now I'm online, an online teacher. Of course, apart from uh, my Zoom classes, I also have a, a YouTube channel. Um, so I like the fact that I can contact, or, or I can reach more students. So in the future, I'd like to com- continue to expand and grow my channel to to reach more and more people around the world. Thank you. And Ben, what do you like best about the area where you live now? Oh, wow. Um, what's not like, what's not to like? I, I moved here just about 18 months ago and um, yeah, I'm, I'm in love with it. It's a beautiful area of the north of Spain. It's very mountainous. Probably what I like best is is the quiet. It's just it's so peaceful and, and no cars or very few cars, very few little traffic, just cows and uh, donkeys and, and lots of animals so i'm i'm in my element okay thank you and how good are you at organizing your free time <laughs> terrible i'm 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 not good at organizing anything i'm just uh, so whether it's work or, or free time or anything i'm just really disorganized so not good at all i would say okay thank you anyway. Just to be clear, that was the two minutes, but Ben was speaking for the two minutes. In the test, it would be two people speaking for of two course. minutes, not only Ben, obviously. Yeah, I, th- I thought that went, that was going on longer. But yeah, you're right. Of course, it would be probably half that time to speak. So usually, usually the candidates get one extra question. But yeah, it's good to take advantage of the opportunity. And, um, and yeah, so I, I think at the end, I... I could have answered that last question a little bit better I was kind of and this is something I always say to my students don't worry about the time in these tasks just keep speaking but I was kind of thinking well surely that's surely that's two minutes but you should just (laughs) stay stay in the zone and don't worry about the time yeah it's obviously easier in the real test because your partner will be speaking some of the time so it it, the pressure will be um, divided Mm. it won't be only on on one candidate but um, Yeah. yeah Yeah, we have to keep that in mind. In fact, we're going to. I'm going to remind you that, yes, we're kind of 
recreating exam conditions here, but we can't 100% um, recreate the exam environment. Um, as I said, Craig is going to be acting as my, my partner in, in some cases. And as we're going to see in a moment with other tasks, it's, it's not that simple. But, um, but yeah, what's your feedback on, on the part one? Very good. I got the impression that you felt very comfortable with English. You answered the questions well. Um, the pronunciation, of course, was <laughs> was excellent. And you used some nice descriptive language, the mountainous area in which you live and the fact that you were in love with the area as well. I noticed that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, very, very natural English, very wide vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, thank you. I, I should mention that, that the first question, where do you live? Oh, sorry, where are you from? Um, that question, as I said, I knew what it was going to be, but you will also know what it's going to be, the candidates who are going to take the exam. So I used some vocabulary like nondescript. Well, I said I, I was born in London, on the outskirts of London in a nondescript neighbourhood. Picturesque, uh, then, I think you said. Yeah, then I moved moved to a village in Cambridge, a picturesque. picturesque. I used quaint in the last video for the C1, so I wanted to use an alternative, a picturesque village. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, now a bu bucolic part of, of the north of Spain. So you may be thinking, well, yeah, it's, it's not fair. Ben prepared that. But yeah, because you can prepare, as I said, just a few nice adjectives. I've taught many of these ad adjectives in other videos, but it, it's it's good. If, as long as it sounds natural and fluent, not rehearsed or robotic, then that's fine for the first two, pitch, uh, the first two questions. Mm -hmm. the sec th those extra questions that Craig asked me, I wasn't prepared for. Um, so if the vocabulary comes up naturally, great. But as I always say, don't obsess too much over the vocabulary. So yeah, good good start. I think, Very good start. Yeah. And one thing, I mean, I noticed this myself because the, this the part one is nice just to get a feeling for the situation. I think obviously I'm sitting in a room in my house and Craig is in a room in his in his house. But it, on the day of the exam, you'll be. You know, just getting a feeling for sitting in front of the interlocutor, the assessor behind him or her, and then your partner or partners with you. So hopefully you'll just be starting to feel a little bit more comfortable after part one, because part two is, is much more demanding and much more challenging. So, Can I just um, comment something on that? Sure, um, yeah. Because uh, as Ben said, in part one, try to relax. The questions will not be too abstract. Now, later in the C2 test, you'll see questions that amplify and go out and they become more hypothetical they become more abstract maybe themes or subjects that you're not used to talking about on a day-to-day -day basis whereas in part one here you have questions i didn't ask ben what mm. do you enjoy about learning english very mm. basic questions for a c2 student when yeah. do you expect to finish your studies what kind of work would you like to do in the future these are not complicated questions you mm. should be able to deal with those quite easily and start to relax and feel good about the test exactly yeah very good point and the, the official name of part one is the interview but sometimes we call it the icebreaker or the the warm-up because that's really what it's for i mean it is evaluated so it is important as I, and as craig said i think body language and nonverbal communication is, is so important here to, to make a good first impression. If you can smile and make eye contact, you know, just, just be a confident person, um, whether, however you're feeling inside. Um, yeah. I, just before we do start part two, I, I just want to explain for those of you who don't know what you have to do in part two, it's called the collaborative task. So this is the first time you will be interacting with your partner. Quite different to the C1 Advanced. The C1 Advanced Part 2 is the long term. So here you will be collaborating. So it's very important to interact. Um, keep the interaction in mind. You know, Always include your partner and respond to your partner. Um, and keep your contributions quite short because you don't have much time. Uh, so you have some pictures. We're going to put some pictures on the screen. This is what I will see. Um, and there are two tasks. The first task is a one minute task, but it's collaborative. You must interact with your partner. So the interlocutor will ask a question and you and your partner must answer the question. The second task is a three minute task. So this is all part two. It's a three minute task where you must speak about all of the pictures and 
complete the task that the interlo interlocutor is, reads to you. Um, it's difficult because there's quite a lot to remember and it's not written on the page. So you don't see it written, you only hear it. There's a little bit of information on the, on the, on the sheet to help you, but you really must focus and pay attention to what the interlocutor says to make sure you complete the task. Um, and as I said, you have to talk about all of the pictures or, or try to, to talk about all of the pictures and remember to do the whole task. As you'll see, there's there's always something extra at the end to that you must do. Craig, anything more to say before we move on to? No, to, I think we're ready to go. Are you ready? Yeah, I think I'm as ready as I'll ever be. Let's do it. Let, okay. Let's, do it. let's go. Yeah. Now, in this part of the test, you're going to do something together. Here are some pictures of different situations. First, I'd like you to look at pictures A and C and talk together about what sounds you associate with these situations. You have about a minute for this, so don't worry if I interrupt you. All right. Okay, well, I think I'll start with picture A, and I think um, the sounds you probably hear in this case is it's obviously raining. It's difficult to know how hard it's raining, but I imagine you can hear the pitter patter yeah. on, on the umbrella, um, and maybe yeah, you'd hear the raindrops, wouldn't you, on the umbrella? Yeah, definitely, and maybe the splashing in the puddles. Yeah, um, uh -huh. and yeah, what People's do you think? Footsteps, perhaps, on the on mm -hmm. the pavement. Um, yeah. Maybe some traffic noises. Yeah, of children, course. Children crying, perhaps. I don't know. What about picture C? What do you think? It looks like an office situation. Yeah, it looks like an office. Uh, so I would imagine maybe telephones ringing in the background, maybe people tapping away on their computer keyboards, uh, yeah. maybe even maybe even have the radio on in the background. Who knows? Or if it was a situation at home, if people are working at home, it could there could be a dog barking, there could be children mm. crying in the other room, washing machine, dishwasher working, depending on the environment. Yeah, it's difficult to know because there's not much to see, but probably the rustling of papers and and other other typical office noises yes, I thank guess. you yeah. now look at all the pictures i'd like you to imagine that a magazine is doing a survey on things that annoy us talk together about how these annoyances affect different individuals and then decide which annoyance has the biggest impact on society you have about three minutes to talk about this so don't worry if i interrupt you Okay. What do you think, Ben? Well, I think it, uh, start with picture A again. I think, yeah, obviously when it's raining and everything's wet, it's really annoying. It's one of my pet peeves. You know, when you arrive to work with soaking wet socks, for example, and you have to sit oh, next to the I radiator to dry them yeah. up, it's cold. I, I, and... That really gets on my nerves when, yeah. when the, the shoes aren't waterproof and yeah. it goes through to your socks. That really annoys me. Yeah, get drenched to the bone. It's uh, It's horrible. But... But I would imagine picture B, you know, this is such a typical situation, a traffic jam, and you know, people can get very frustrated and even could be some road rage in, in these situations. What do you think? Yeah. It, especially if, you, if your air conditioning isn't working in the car or you haven't got anything to listen to, there are no podcasts or no music, and you just have to listen to the traffic noises and people revving their engines yeah. and the beeping of the horns. It could be very frustrating. And queuing in D, I mean, that's that's annoying as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's horrible, especially if you're in a hurry and you, you just want to... It's difficult to see what these people are queuing for in this photo, but in general, queuing, if you just, you know, to go and get some money out of the bank, withdraw some money or just to run an errand and you find that you have to wait in a, in a queue for for 30 minutes, it can be, it can be frustrating. Yeah, well, they do say it's the British national pastime, but I think... Uh, yeah, the yeah, world if, champions. If, <laughs> and everybody probably on their mobile phones to pass the time, but it, there is a feeling of you're wasting time when you're mm. queuing and that the world is just um, standing still. Mm -hmm. uh, does anything annoy you about a messy desk? Uh, yeah, I can imagine that being as I yeah, I can imagine that being annoying. I'm a very messy person in general, so I if you could see my desk now, you can't see it <laughs> from the the camera angle, but it, it's uh, it's something I need to get better at. It's it's diff difficult to find things, isn't it? So I wish yeah. I were more organized, but it's a quite a personal issue. This you know, it doesn't depend on other people; it depends on you. So I, I don't think this would be suitable for the magazine 
Um, but picture E with the graffiti, I, I guess that's representing the graffiti or street art. Uh, yeah, I think some people, it depends on the graffiti, doesn't it? If That doesn't look too bad for me. I know it's covered the whole, I don't know if that's a basketball court, but um, mm -hmm. perhaps it's a, a basketball court. But um, yeah, it can be, it, it can give a bad impression of, of, a, of a neighborhood, I guess, from some people's perspectives. Um, but what, so we, so yeah, go sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to ask you, what, what do you think is the most, is the best picture to choose for the, the, well, we have to we have to decide which annoyance has the biggest impact on mm -hmm. on society, and I think these days, well, it could be it could be climate change, which maybe a represents, or it could also be traffic because, I mean, everybody likes their car, and mm. pollution is a problem as well. Congestion in big cities, so I think that that could be it could be traffic. Yeah, I would what go. Do you, what do you the, think? Yeah, I think I would choose traffic. I think so many people are affected by traffic. Even those those of us who don't have cars, it's you know it, you can get affected by traffic jams, by the the pollution, the emissions that are um, are caused by by traffic, and it just can hold up people's days. So so it can so be. We agree on annoying. traffic. I think. I think we can stick with with traffic. Yeah. Okay, that's the one, yeah. And that's the three minute. Well, actually, that was a bit longer than three minutes. But... Okay. We did arrive at a decision. Yeah, there's no no ob obligation, by the way, to arrive at a decision. We just you have to go through the process. So you know, have to try to to agree. But you can say in the end, actually, I, I just don't agree with you, and you, that's fine. It's absolutely fine. But we did. We we agreed, and that's that's good too. As long as we we continue speaking. Now I have to mention before we continue that I did forget the ex I I remembered that we had to do something. But that to choose one of the pictures, and I wasn't sure if it was to choose one of the pictures from, from a magazine ma magazine article, yeah. but it was um, repeated. What, what was that extra part, the last task? It was the biggest impact on society. And the only reason I remembered it was because I have it written here in front <laughs> right. of me. So yeah, it's very, try to remember uh, what you have to try to agree on and decide um and you there's no problem in in repeating it mm. so you can repeat the question after you've been asked it and maybe that will help um imprint it in in your mind but it is important to uh to try and and do the second part of the task some of my students who are watching this will be laughing because i've said this so many times to them that don't forget the extra little task of choosing one or, or two of the pictures i didn't forget it but i just forgot exactly what the the question was so it's uh really have to pay attention and stay focused and hope if you don't remember hope your partner has remembered or like like craig helped me out i mean as he said he read it but um maybe your partner will remember it uh, it's such a difficult thing to do because you think you have so many things to think about you have to or think if you about. can't remember just say to your partner we have to deci decide something don't we what do yeah. we have to decide i think Honesty is the best policy in many ways. If you don't remember, just say that. Uh, to be honest, I've forgotten and, and hope your partner, the best scenario in that case would be that your partner remembers and, and can help you. And But if you're honest and, and natural, then that's, I think that will be, uh, that will be fine. Anyway, um, going back to part one. So the, the, the one minute task. So it was mm -hmm. about uh, what sounds we might hear in these situations, picture A and C. So the, the interlocutor will tell you which pictures you have to speak about. Uh, by the way, something I didn't mention, um, for this part two task, you will always get some pictures uh, as prompts or stimuli, but you, it may just be one picture. It could be anything from one to up to seven pictures. So be prepared mentally for that. It, usually it's three, four, or five. In my experience doing these, you know, looking at sample, past sample papers, it's usually three, four, or five. But you know, if you just see one or two pictures and up, anything up to seven, then you know just have to deal with this, de deal with it, and obviously manage the the discussion in a different way. Um, so yeah, and I think, well, sorry, I'll, I'll let Craig give his feedback feedback before I, I give mine. Well, I didn't, I couldn't really focus on specific language that the oh, Ben and I were using because I was I was doing the task. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do remember that we tried to use some interesting vocabulary when it came to describing the raindrops and the umbrellas, mm. the sound of the pitter-patter of the raindrops. And um, the, 
the thing is before i chose why did i choose a and c as an examiner i would choose a and c because they are two pictures where there probably would be some background sound mm -hmm. now it may be in your test if the examiner chooses e you're thinking well are there any sounds could there be any mm -hmm. sounds in that picture then you have to use your imagination and use some suggestive language like well perhaps or maybe or there could be or if it's a noisy city conditional sentences that kind of thing you have to use your imagination to say what there possibly could be yeah. so sometimes the pictures might be a bit tricky but um i think we use some good vocabulary ben we used I messy we desk did. we yeah. used tidy we used um uh, soggy socks i think you said yes i think i said soaked but yeah soggy is soaked. even, even soaked. better yeah that, that, yeah soaked or drenched drenched to the bone um, drenched to the bone yeah yeah you said rev, revving up their engines um so yeah i think, I think we did all right we did use some good vocabulary um yeah it's right about that speculation because there, there's another task um in one of the the sample proficiency to um Cambridge sample paper books where it's very similar but one of the pictures is just an old woman an elderly woman sewing or embroidering it's a close up of her and and the, the cloth and the question is the same what what noises or what sounds do you think you could hear and and students really struggle with that because you can't see anything you, you know what may, i can think have... i can think of some horrible bodily functions but i won't mention them <laughs> <laughs> no. you might hear yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, a, that's a good question i don't know if you if uh, you could say that if you could get the get the examiner to laugh i'm sure you you get some bonus points for that but, what are the difficult in that situation it's difficult to know what to say well i think it? as you said it's all about speculating because we don't know we don't i mean with the rain you you know the pitter patter of the rain on the umbrella but in the office environment you can think of the typical noises but if as you said with picture e you if it were you know if the examiner was feeling cruel and, and chose e they just had to say you know maybe there are there's some traffic or maybe there are birds or pigeons flying maybe there are kids i mean not just repeating maybe all the time like like i am but there might be there could be perhaps those kind that yeah. kind of vocabulary but you know don't i think the problem is that when students get those kind of questions the first reaction is to panic and think there are no sounds in that picture there's you know that there, there's nothing and but just open your mind and imagine what what you can't see but could be there and as so, ben said before just be honest i mean just say well to be honest um if i think about it i don't know what sounds i would hear from a mm -hmm. situation like this if there's a, an elderly woman sitting in a chair sewing i don't think you would hear many sounds except maybe a clock ticking mm-hmm so yeah. just be honest and just just um, say what you what you think and speculate. Yeah. Okay, but yeah, I think we did. I, one thing I wanted to mention, apart from the vocabulary, I think our interaction was good, um, as it should be. I mean, because we both have a lot of experience uh, preparing uh, preparing students for the exam, and, and in your case, evaluating students and, and testing students. So you know, we spoke about one picture asked our partner to to contribute and then moved on to the next picture both both candidates should have an opportunity to say something about each of the pictures and then move on and we, you could see we were moving on quite quickly you don't want to get stuck on one of the pictures because although three minutes seems like a long time there's a lot to do so you have mm -hmm. to say something ask your partner your partner should respond to what you've said then move on to the next picture and then ask you what, what you think and keep moving on and don't forget that little extra task. So One extra thing I'd like to mention, mm -hmm. um, and that's the difference uh, that I think exists between C2 in, in this kind of activity and B2, for example. In B2 with a partner, you're probably expected to produce expressions to ask opinion and give opinion. What do you think about blah, blah, blah? Uh, what's your view, et cetera, et cetera. If you noticed when we did this together, I spoke on top of Ben mm. a couple of times. It try to it's, it should be a more of a natural mm. chat, yeah. Discussing these pictures, so don't wait for turn taking. So you know, don't be afraid of of commenting exactly after your partner or even a little bit on top of your partner, mm. just as they're finishing speaking, because it is it is a general relaxed informal chat about what you think the pictures are about. 
Yeah, that's very interesting because it's uh, natural. That's natural conversation. Exactly. Yeah, it's not well, just as we did just now. It's um, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, when you, I always say to my students, when you finish speaking, ask your partner for their opinion because you have to signal that you're not just pausing for breath or th to think in that case. But as you said, and a student asked me this just yesterday, can I interrupt my my partner? And the answer. Because I think it happened when they practiced this, her and her partner, they kind of spoke over each other a little bit. At C2 level? Yeah, C2 level, exactly. Yeah, And I said, yeah, sometimes it's necessary to interrupt your partner if they're talking too much. But in this case, that's not, where we're, not what we're talking about. It's just talking over each other, but not, you know, giving your partner a chance to say and finish what they're saying. But maybe you're not waiting necessarily until the end. You can talk over them a little bit it's it's natural that's how we speak in, in real life but you know yeah. don't it's important not to continuously interrupt your partner when they're trying to say something of course it's it's common no. sense it's, it's yeah, natural, you have to be but... sensitive to to your partner but when ben was talking about wet socks which personally is something i hate it's uh, ben used the expression pet peeve which is mm. nice vocabulary it's a pet peeve of mine as well mm. which is why i jumped in mm. on top of it oh yeah i hate i hate it when that happens i can't stand wet yeah. socks yeah i think that's a nice thing to do in c2 yeah and um and i think that's one of the differences between between lower levels and c2 so yeah now moving on to part three so we're going to divide part three into two different parts so the first it's the long term where the candidates will speak for two minutes um answering a question so today we're just going to do one of these it's just going to be my long term but there are some important things to, to keep in mind about this task. I always say that this is a simple task, but it's not easy because it's simple because you just have to answer the question. You just have to speak for two minutes answering the question. It's not like part two where you have to kind of complete a task. You just have to speak for two minutes. You don't have to come to any conclusion. Just keep speaking. Uh, there are some ideas on the card, as the interlocutor will explain. There are three ideas on the card, which you can use if you like. I always recommend that you don't use those, don't even look at the, the ideas. I mean, it's difficult to ignore them, but try to ignore them until you feel you need some help. So I think it's always easier just to start with your own ideas. Uh, just try to answer the question, stay in the zone, develop your own ideas. And then if you're you know, after a minute or a minute and a half, if you're running out of things to say, then check the ideas and maybe that they'll just help you get get to the finishing line, so to speak. The, the problem with using the ideas on the card immediately is that they can take you in a direction that maybe you, you don't really feel comfortable talking about. But it's just answering the question on the card. As I said, it's not easy. It's a pr particularly difficult task. It's difficult to appreciate it until you practice it. I know from my students' experience, it seems very easy when you when you observe someone else doing it, but when you have to do it yourself, it's pretty tricky. Yeah. Very important to keep in mind too that when you finish your long term, so when candidate A finishes their long term, for me in this case, there will be a question for candidate B, your partner, uh, on the same topic, but a different question. So that just a, a 20 or 30 second response to that. But then after that, there will be another question for candidate A, which will be, do you agree? What do you think? Or how do you feel? Or uh, sorry, how about you? So you have to be listening to what your partner says. You can't switch off. And this is very common. Pe people tend to disconnect when they've finished their long term because they've been, it's quite stressful and they start to think about the vocabulary they haven't used and, and the grammar they, the grammar mistakes they've made but you have to listen to what your partner is saying. Very important. So again, it's going to be a bit tricky today for Craig because he's going to be asking me the first question. I'm going to speak for two minutes, hopefully. Um, and then I think what we'll do is that maybe I will ask Craig the extra question. You have to imagine it's the interlocutor asking Craig the extra question. And then maybe Craig can just say, do you agree or, or what do you think yeah. for my extra question? But So you have to imagine me wearing two hats, the examiner hat and the candidate hat. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so uh, I think that's everything. I know it sounds quite complicated, but it, it should be fine. It should be clear once we give you an example. Exactly. That's okay. It. Now, 
In this part of the test, you're each going to talk on your own for about two minutes. You need to listen while your partner's speaking because you'll be asked to comment afterwards. So, Ben, I'm going to give you a card with a question written on it, and I'd like you to tell us what you think. There are also some ideas on the card for you to use if you like. All right. So, Ben, here is your card. Mm -hmm. Remember, you have about two minutes, Ben, to talk before we join in. Okay. So what creates a positive learning environment? Well, I think first and foremost, it's the teacher that uh, who creates uh, a positive learning environment. I think it's one of their main responsibilities uh, to, to make sure that the students feel comfortable um, and can ask questions if necessary, and that they're, they're in a, a safe and pleasant place to learn. I think also the, the teacher has to be approachable. I think um, that's part of the learning environment, how the the teacher, the, the way that the students feel about the teacher, that they can ask questions, approach them if they have any any doubts. But also the students, I think the students too make, are, are important, they're an important aspect of the learning environment. They, you know, if we're talking about group classes, um, I think the way the students interact uh, helps to, to create a, a positive learning environment. Um, also, I mean, thinking of the physical environment, the, the layout of the class, perhaps how the tables and chairs are, are placed around the class, you know, the, the formations, so if they're in the sort of traditional rows or in a semicircle, that uh, it can change the way that the, the classes are taught and the way that the students um, receive the information that they're being taught. So, yeah, the physical space, I guess the 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 size of the, the room also would be important. Um, so, yeah, I've spoken about the people, the resources. Yeah, I guess nowadays with all the technology we have available, uh, the resources that can be used will potentially affect how positive the learning environment is. So if you're using interactive screens, for example, um, or tablets for... Thank you, Ben. Okay. Okay. Craig, do you think schools do a good job? Uh, no, it is the, is the short answer. I don't think schools do a, do a good job. I think they can be they can be improved a lot. And when I say that, I mean the things that should be taught in schools very often are not taught in schools. And I think some subjects that are taught in schools, English, for example, here in Spain, are not taught particularly well. Um, I think that we could do a lot better in focusing on creative skills and softer skills because there is a push now for science and maths and passing tests. And I think a lot of creativity is lost in that process. And it's very exam-based. And I don't think examinations are necessarily um, a foolproof way of measuring a person's ability. Mm -hmm. Do you agree, Ben? Uh, unfortunately, I do agree. Yeah, because I think uh, I think it's mostly the education system. I don't blame the teachers necessarily, or even the headmasters or headmistresses. It's I think it's just the system, and I think it's quite an antiquated system. It, I think we should use more. I know technology is being used, but maybe more be be a bit more imaginative. Use more dynamic, uh, cre create more dynamic learning environments and um, maybe using more gaming technology and that type of thing. I think there needs to be a mini revolution in the education system. Personally. Thank you. Okay. And teachers yeah. need to be paid more as well. <laughs> That's the most important thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was tricky, of course, because I just want to remind everyone that of course, when I asked Craig that extra question, it would be the interlocutor asking the partner and then the interlocutor would ask the original student candidate, me in this case, do you agree? So we just, did improvised. it a different way yeah, yeah improvised a bit <laughs> um so that was yeah it was tricky those two minutes it's because you Last, know you're it seems your longer than two minutes doesn't it when you're talking it, by it, yourself it does yeah yeah it, it feels it's, it's quite a surreal experience because you're kind of just left alone to speak for two minutes and you know nobody's going to interrupt you you know you can't ask questions you, got, you don't have a partner to help you so 
it's um strange experience but um how how did i do craig for the lot the two minutes well first of all i think it's fair to say that you were given a a, a question that you probably could speak about quite easily <laughs> so <laughs> you use some lovely vocabulary <laughs> connected to classroom teaching mm. um safe and pleasant environment the layout of semicircle uh, classes and the physical space so lots of lovely vocabulary which you would expect thing from a mm. from a native english teacher um and yeah and you did speak really really well um without necessarily needing the prompts on the card i think you used the prompts as a backup mm. in the second minute and you just looked down and and that helped you to springboard onto another area to to talk about so yeah. um that's that's a very good idea i i don't actually i've never actually suggested that but thinking about it that is a very good idea to try and start speaking just based on the question and only use the prompts um, if you're if you're feeling that you you need more ideas. And I, I deliberately wanted to do that today to demonstrate that I did speak about my own ideas, the teachers, the students, the classroom layout. But I thought, well, actually, I can't think of much more. So I'm going to look at the, the ideas. And I'd already spoken about people, really, I guess, the teachers and the students. So that the resources and it did it. it something i hadn't thought about it made me think about the modern technical technology so it really it it's the best way in my opinion but every individual is different as craig said perhaps this question was easier to answer than some others so that will affect how you approach this task if you find it's a question that's really tough to answer you may need to use the the ideas the prompts on the card immediately Mm -hmm. so you have to be a bit flexible yeah yeah the rubric does say the examiner examiner instruct instructions um, does say there are some ideas on the card for you to use if you like mm. so you don't have to it's not compulsory exactly uh, and another thing that we should stress is that you're given about 10 seconds to think mm. to read the card there isn't much to read it's just one sentence and those three prompts read the card and think so use every second of yeah. those 10 seconds to think of ideas and what you're going to say. Prepare yourself. Don't jump immediately into answering the question. Make the most of those 10 seconds to, to have a think of what you can say about the topic. Yeah. And with those 10 seconds, the interlocutor will tell you when the 10 seconds are up. They will encourage you to start speaking because I know some people think, well, do I have to count 10 seconds in my head or no, no. don't worry. It's... <laughs> the, the interlocutor will say, would you like to begin now, please? Mm -hmm. And then, then, you know, you have to start. Yeah. You don't have to use that. Like I didn't use those 10 seconds. Some people feel a bit comfortable, uh, feel a bit uncomfortable sitting in silence for 10, silence, 10 seconds. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I, I agree with Craig. Uh, take advantage of every second just to sort of, at least for the first couple of sentences, think about how you're going to get the ball rolling. Um, but yeah, good. And I think, Craig, your response to the extra question was, was excellent. Again, probably a, some, an issue quite close to your heart, perhaps. I think you obviously had a lot, a lot of opinions and it, it's always easier to talk about something that you've perhaps thought about or even spoken about previously. Yeah, I also feel that even if you say something that might be just a little bit controversial or maybe something that the examiner is not necessarily expecting to hear, I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Because if you believe it, then there's passion there. Mm -hmm. And you say what you think, you give your opinion, you'll probably be able to speak easier if you're trying to communicate your strong feelings about something yeah. than if you're just making something up to please the examiner. So yeah. if there is a question that sparks something inside you and you want to say something, as long as it's not maybe too extreme, <laughs> then by all means, express your opinion and say what you think. Yeah. Um, and examiners, I think, like to hear that. I certainly do. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, I mean, we spoke a little about a little bit about this in the last video that you don't have to tell the truth. You don't have to give your honest feelings, but it's easier. It's easier to speak about something, as you said, that you feel passionately about or that it's from a, an authentic place that you're, you know, if you start inventing answers, it, it may help you if, you know, if you don't have an opinion about something, it's something you've never really thought about, then perhaps you have to invent something. But if you do have a strong opinion that maybe you think, oh, maybe I shouldn't say this. It's a bit controversial. Maybe the examiner doesn't agree with me. It doesn't matter whether he or she agrees with you or not. It's They're not evaluating your 
I, political ideas or anything like that. They're evaluating what you say, what comes out of your mouth. So um, exactly, don't worry about offending. I, I always say that, and maybe you as an experienced examiner, Craig, the examiners don't go home that night and think about what you said while they're having their dinner or while they're putting their kids to bed or watching master chef no. on tv <laughs> they're not no uh, and your exam is not the only exam the examiner is going to be dealing with that morning or that afternoon they're probably be going to do five or six or more exams back to back one after the other mm. so, uh, exactly yeah, yeah, yeah don't exactly. worry about don't worry about that no and you're, it's, it's it's tricky that task is tricky even for me an, an, a native english speaker who has has a lot of experience with these exams and has given lots of tips and you know, my videos and my courses, I, I found it quite, um, quite demanding. But let's just say before, yeah. before we move on, Ben, yeah. one, one thing to practice that, because as Ben said, it is tricky. Just use this, use mm -hmm. your phone, time yourself for two minutes and speak about something and then mm -hmm. listen back. How do you sound? Are you hesitating a lot? Did you use some nice varied vocabulary? Can you improve on what you've just recorded in two minutes well go again do it again mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. keep practicing with your phone and listening back and being self-critical yeah. and find ways that you can improve that's really really powerful and if you practice that a lot the two minutes will just fly by yeah very good advice okay so moving on to the last well this is still part three but it's the last part of the speaking exam which is the discussion again as craig said earlier perhaps the questions well, the questions will be maybe a little bit more abstract or deeper or philosophical. Um, but still, I think this is the best part of the speaking paper because you just hopefully have a nice chat, a nice discussion with your partner. But it is evaluated. It is an important part of the exam. So remember, it's an interaction, not monologues. You don't want to speak for two minutes and then ask your partner's opinion. Keep it short, like 20 or 30 seconds, more or less, and back. A tennis match or, or passing the ball type thing. And this is this is the final chance you have to shine, the last part of the test. Mm. So you should be feeling pretty relaxed by now. Hopefully you've you've been through most of the of the test. You've done your two minute long turn. Now you can relax into this last part that's more interactive mm. and really let your English shine and impress the interlocutor and have a nice conversation with with your partner. Exactly. Yeah. This is it. Opportunity. Opportunity. That's the word I, I want you to think of when you're in the exam in the speaking paper it's my opportunity to demonstrate my level so so yeah here we go so it will be about four minutes this this part of the exam just to the end of the the exam but about four minutes so okay so shall we kick off yep now to finish the test we're going to talk about surroundings in general so ben what can you learn about a person by looking at their workspace <laughs> okay what can you learn all oh, right well i guess when when you're referring to workspace it's your your desk um so i guess you can learn quite a lot about a person you know somebody who's messy and untidy perhaps is disorganized like me for example whereas a very neat and orderly person is probably a more uh, yeah, organized person in general. So I guess you get a, a bit of a, a window into their personality by looking at their, their desk or their workspace. What do you think? Well, some people say that a clean and tidy desk is the sign of a sick mind. I don't <laughs> necessarily agree with that. I I think that um, I like to be quite neat and tidy mm. and keep my things organized, but but that's just me. And, and I live with my partner who is very untidy. She She feels comfortable around mess mm -hmm. so i i'm very protective of my workspace do you have the problem at home or are you do you pretty much have the run of the house and you can do what you like in your own space no i, I have my space which is this room and it's a mess uh it's a disaster but um yeah my partner doesn't come in here much because <laughs> she, she would go mad if she saw it she drives her mad because she's more organized and, and tidy definitely so, so do you set aside a particular time of week or or month or year where you tidy up when you tidy <laughs> up or, or not no it's just when i when it gets a bit too much when i when i think this is you know you need to do something now it's a uh, it's a uh, it's time uh, you know no I, i'm i'm getting better to be honest i'm better than i was a few years ago but um no i 
I, I would be embarrassed if I moved the camera around and showed you my room. We won't, we won't ask you to, to do that. No. Um, ben, what skills should children be taught to prepare them for the world around them? That's a big question. Uh, I think practical skills are necessary. Of course, the, the school subjects, uh, the, the geography, history, maths, the languages are all important, of course. But yeah, especially languages. Languages are particularly practical. But I think um, a lot of children grow up and, and leave school and home without really understanding, you know, typical things like how to do your tax declaration or, or perhaps exactly. even like how to change your, your um, change your uh, wheel of a car to um, replace your skills. Yeah. Yeah. Th those kind of things. Um, yeah. yeah. Would you yeah, agree? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I would. I think also um, things like this presentation skills, communication mm -hmm. skills. I think these days with the limited uh, attention span that, that younger people have and the fact that we are constantly interacting with screens more than we're interacting with people. I think it's really important to teach children at school how to build relationships, how to behave at conferences when they're meeting people for the first time, how to mm. make friends, how to interact. And those personal and interpersonal skills, I think, are, are overlooked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the public speaking, especially, I think it's people get so nervous in those situations that it's good a good idea to practice to, to have some experience with it definitely to, to expose yourself to to those situations because in, in most jobs in, you're going to have to do it at some point so yeah could you think of one thing you learned at school that you've never ever needed to know anything that's been completely useless to you i mean i learned maths and algebra and algebra and I was thinking, and, yeah uh, log thinking, tables and i've never ever used any of that <laughs> i was thinking yeah algebra was the first thing that came to my mind but i also thought of the i remember that i learned by heart i think it was the first 14 states of the united states of america why did you stop at 14 i don't know i think that, there's a there's a reason for that i don't know if anybody who knows history could, they were the first 14 oh, the first were, 14 and then they expanded after that to yeah it was the first that, that had been established at that point in history is an important part point in history i don't remember why but i remember i learned them all off by heart you know what a waste of brain space and and energy and resources i don't know okay we'll we'll stop there because that was nearly four and a half minutes i was just too involved in the conversation to, <laughs> okay, to fine, notice yeah. to notice the time which is a good thing you want to be doing that and you want yeah. the interlocutor to stop you in the middle and say thank you because that means that you've you've been involved in the conversation and yeah and you've yeah. been speaking no i thought that was it was good i thought it was all it was, it was nice i mean it, it should be really we, we are two native speakers english <laughs> teachers with a lot of experience so if it wasn't if we can't have a nice if we can't do it who can right <laughs> exactly yeah. so but it, hopefully it's a, a good example hopefully people can get a lot from that and um, thank you again craig that was fantastic again very professionally done um pleasure thank you and uh yeah maybe we'll, we'll do another one or i'd like to have you back on my channel again as an examiner or just maybe we could just have a a, a, a nice chat without worrying about um <laughs> doing the, <exam laughs> the rubrics tasks. there <laughs> exactly yeah yeah without worrying about our performances anytime uh, it's always nice it's yeah. always nice to come on your channel Ben. great thanks greg i'll see you again soon take care bye bye